Now, I don't know if you have a, any 120-year-old light bulbs that still work. world we live in, this is where it started. Isn't that amazing? My grandma, my grandpa Blackburn told me that when he was courting Grandma Eddie, uh, she would light the kerosene lamp and set it next to this so that when the power plant shut down at nine, he wouldn't notice that the electricity had gone out because he would think a gentleman should be leaving at nine o'clock. And I thought, well, how could you tell the electricity? How would you not notice the electric lights going out? How would a kerosene lamp get? Now I understand how the kerosene lamp, it would, you wouldn't know the difference. I'm going to extinguish this now. For obvious reasons, I don't burn it long. <laughs> and in fact, I may light that only a couple more times in my life because I'd like to pass it on to my grandkids as a hand-blown Edison bulb that still works. Watch me trip on the cord, and <laughs> you'll hear words you haven't heard before. What's the filament in that? It's carbon, right? Is it carbon? Or what is it? I, think it's, I think it's carbon. It hasn't been played much, but just a little bit, it's starting to blacken up, blacken up inside. Yeah. So, well, there, that's a little more what we expected, isn't it? <laughs> a generation before that, uh, the Condons got here. And Nathaniel and Rachel Condon came sometime in the 1830s. Uh, I was thinking it was 1836. Cousin Pete says more like 1838. And Mary Milks thinks more like 1838. Sometime in there a long time ago. There were four couples came uh, from upstate New York together. Condon's to Nikes, Springsteads, and Derrick's. And they were all related. One was the wife of the husband of the other couple, or the sister, I mean. <laughs> And uh, 20 years, roughly, before Broadhead was here. And so if uh, Nathaniel Condon had been, driving, uh, had been driving his cutter through here on a winter night 20 years before Broadhead was here, uh, he, he might have, if he were like me, he would be writing poetry, imitating other poets. <laughs> and he might have said something like, um, my little horse must think it queer to stop without a village near on this the coldest night of the year between frozen river and snowy wake. He asks if there is some mistake by giving his harness bells a shake. Guess what I have now? <laughs> Here they are. These are the uh, harness bells. They came from upstate New York. Uh, in the 1830s with our great-great-grandpa. He, he died so long ago, Broadhead was only a year old when, when he died in 1857. But these are the harness bells that came way back then. Now when he had livestock for sale, what did he do? Put them on the train? Now Broadhead wasn't even here, much less the train. He walked them overland to Galena and sold them down the river. And that's what everybody did with their produce, uh, their crops, their livestock in the 1830s, 1840s, early 1850s. You walk to Galena, you put it on a boat. Go to Galena. The river there in 1840 was deeper than the Mississippi at Dubuque is now. And at Galena, that river looks like our sugar river. And uh, the commerce was tied to the Old South. The Ohio River, for goodness sakes, tied to the Old South. It was easier to go from Pittsburgh to New Orleans than from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia before trains. And, uh, yeah, and they, uh, Eastern investors, Eastern politicians, wanted the West, which was Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois. That was the West in 1850. They wondered if they could capture the business of the West. And so they promoted East-West railroads. The Old South got mad and started shooting for more than one reason. <laughs> and so the railroads, when they came, connected us with places like, like Buffalo and Boston and New York City instead of places like St. Louis, Memphis, and New Orleans. And the economy shifted from north-south to east-west here. And people in Milwaukee were very eager to connect the Great Lakes 
the Great Lakes with the outlets to the rest of the world and, and the eastern coast with the Mississippi River, which was the connection to the Old South and the Gulf of Mexico. So let's build a railroad from Milwaukee to Prairie du Chien. And so the Milwaukee and Mississippi Railroad was founded to do that, and it did. And that was the first railroad in Wisconsin. You'd think, by modern standards, the first railroad in Wisconsin would have run from Milwaukee to Chicago. Nah, ran from Milwaukee to Prairie du Chien. Didn't connect with another railroad. Connected with boats at both ends. And while they were building it, they decided, let's, if one place to hit the Mississippi is good, let's do it in two. And so they created Milton Junction, and they started building a branch that would go through the lead mining region because half the people of Wisconsin lived between Mineral Point and Shellsburg at the time. Rich mining producing area. And so and they started building a railroad from Milton Junction to Janesville to Monroe. They were going to Dubuque with it, but it stopped in Monroe because an economic uh, depression occurred. And so then you had a, a Y-shaped railroad, Milwaukee to Prairie du Chien, and Milton Junction to Monroe. Well, it got to both Prairie du Chien and Monroe in 1857, but in 1856 it came through here. There was no here, here, then. <laughs> there was Clarence and there was Decatur. And neither town would give the land or the money to build a depot and railroad yards, and the railroad says, all right, we'll split the difference. Do you ever look at a map and see our railroad route? Splitting the difference was the best decision anyway. You ever flew over it. Splitting the difference gave us a, a railroad line from Orfordville to Judah, straight to Narrow. The beautiful route. With a little bit better track, that could be a high-speed railroad to this day. When they went west of Monroe, very curvaceous and squiggly. You could tell it was built to a different standard, intended to be just a country branch line. But from Milwaukee to Monroe, you could run some trains if you wanted to. And so, in, uh, and, and why why did the railroads expect people to give them anything? Wasn't it big business? Just money grubbing capitalists? What's this all about? Well, there was a different mindset in pioneering times. I get a taste of it when I go up to our, our place up by Hayward in Stone Lake. I have, a, I have 160 acres and a cabin up by Stone Lake because Frank and Carol, Carol Gumbar have 160 acres and a house up by Stone Lake. They're the ones who introduced me to the region and it's wonderful. And when I leave that cabin and drive down the township road through the woods, very often there's a tree down. And what do I do? Call the township employees to come fix it? No. I go back to the cabin, grab a chainsaw, and take care of it. Because there's a, that sense that a problem is everybody's problem. Let's pitch in and be men and take care of it. Do they do that in New Jersey when there's a problem on the Garden State Expressway? They go take care of it themselves? <laughs> Well, so population density kind of takes away from that independence and, and that self-reliance. So in the 1850s, when the railroad was coming, it was common for a town, the townsmen to get out and go wield shovels and picks and help build it. Let's get it here in a hurry. There were towns that the townspeople would build the depot. They'd volunteer labor. Let's go build a depot over the weekend as a gift. Yay. Everybody owned a problem. Let's just pitch in and get her done. Besides that, the United States wasn't capital rich in the 1850s. A lot of the stock that was bought was in the form of hogs and bushels of wheat. The railroad would sell it, trying to get some money. Most of the money came from Europe to build this. And when the rails came to New York, made in England, we weren't yet an industrial powerhouse. We made rails, but the ones who brought it came from England. Uh, they were impounded in New York City because there wasn't money to pay the import tax on it. And Ludlow from Monroe with his bank, I think First National, made a loan to the Milwaukee and Mississippi River Railroad just to get the money to pay the tax so they could bring the railroads and rails and lay the rails. So uh, they got going on it. Well, the, uh, the town spontaneously grew. grew. Uh, Clarence and Decatur just moved to town. It, it, Avon too, yeah. It was that important. Uh, it wasn't just nice to have a railroad. If your town didn't get it, your property values could fall to zero overnight. The place that did get the railroad, the property values could multiply many times over. Uh, do you want to be Nathaniel Condon and walk to Galena behind a 
herd the cows or do you want to drive them to Glen or Marion Condon Stockyard, put them on the train and let the train take them to Chicago Union Stockyards. You know, a little bit of a difference. Francis Smith over here, his brother wrote a letter from Clarno in, in the, uh, around 1860 and said, I've been to church, I've had lunch, I wish I could stop over and have a cup of coffee and visit for a couple hours, but we are 16 miles apart, you might as well be on the other side of the moon. <laughs> so being able to get someplace was nice. We take it for granted, but if you didn't have it, you might want the train to come to town. And shipping things, all the necessity, the mail, the everything depended on it. Very important. Well. Nathaniel Condon, with his sleigh bells, uh, wanted a railroad here, and Broadhead wasn't here yet. And a group of Green County people, before the railroad got here, were saying, we need a railroad, let's have a railroad coming out of Illinois that connects with the line from Chicago to Galena, and let's run it north through Green County. We don't know where it'll go, but maybe it'll go to Madison, more likely off to Toma, or in the Great North Pineries, or maybe La Crosse, we don't know. And a lot of railroads started, and they didn't know where they'd end. We'll build it and we'll see when we get there. Hard to believe now, but that's the way it went. And so the Sugar River Valley Railroad was incorporated. And it began a building, and they were selling stock locally. Local railroad, who else cared much? They were selling local stock. Nathaniel Condon mortgaged the farm, put all the money into stock in the Sugar River Valley Railroad. They started building the roadbed at the Illinois state line came up paralleling the county line till they got right behind the cemetery. They hung northwest and went right through where town is now and right up what's now the bike trail. If you look at the bike trail, it curves just before it comes into West 3rd Avenue. But if you extend that line before it curves straight, it goes right through town, comes out over by the cemetery. That's where the Sugar River Valley Railroad grade went. And then what happened? The Milwaukee and Mississippi is building out through here. And everybody's saying, I don't know if Green County can support two railroads that they may not pay and nobody would buy more stock. And that railroad grade sat there. It had been paid for, but you know, you need rails and locomotives and trains running to get a return on investment. There was no return on investment. They foreclosed on Nate Condon's farm. He lost everything. And uh, no Sugar River Valley Railroad. Once out in Joe Burke's Cheese Factory Museum, I saw a big leather-bound book that said Stock Ledger, Sugar River Valley Railroad. I would love to look in it and see how much Nate Condon invested. If, if any of you ever seen that book, somebody has it. Jerry Burke, Joe's dad, said that uh, that museum was sold at auction. I would love to know who got the Stock Ledger for the Sugar River Valley. If I had it, I'd donate it to the museum, but I don't know who got it. Sometimes these valuable things get away. That just as an aside, that little that house over there where I grew up, uh, Francis and Hannah Smith's house, beside the front door, we had a little table that had the initials BJ inlaid in the top. And mom said, that's my, that's your great grandma's great grandma's table. Betsy Jones, her husband, or her brother was John Paul. Okay, I sold that table for $35 at the auction. A year ago, I'm reading the uh, biography of John Paul Jones, and it said when Congress created the U.S. Navy, they told John Paul Jones to commission the first ship, and he named it for his sister, the Betsy. Do you think I should have got more than 35 bucks for the table? Anyway, so, so the Sugar River Valley Railroad didn't make it. And tonight, we went out to the Sandberg Cafe, Pat Wheaton, Pat Condon, and I, and just down the road behind it, what's the name of the road behind the Sandberg Cafe? Avon. Avon Road? Okay. Town Line. Town Line. Town Line Road. Okay. Go east on it. And when you get to the first driveway on the, on the right, which is fire number? 18046. Sounds like we're doing bingo. Okay. Uh, right beside that driveway, you will find going through the woods a railroad right of way. And on the left is a driveway with railroad ties for fence posts. That driveway is on the Sugar River Valley Railroad. Make a Sunday afternoon tour sometime of driving around and see what you can find of the Sugar River Valley Railroad. It, it, it's out there, but not highly visible. And so we got the railroad, and it, it uh, 
made all the world a difference to Broadhead. How did Broadhead get its name? I'm sure everybody in this room knows that story. That uh, Mr. Broadhead said he would... Yeah, he, he would give the uh, bell to the first church completed if they'd named the town for him. And the Methodists and the Congregationalists had a race, and the Methodists won. And I've been in the basement of both churches, uh, and uh, the, uh, the floor joists are logs with bark all around. Uh, they hurried, and they raced. And as a kid, I used to ring Mr. Broadhead's bell in the Methodist church for church services. You probably did too, Pete. And... Um, he was the chief engineer of the railroad, but very shortly, and that's construction engineer, as in civil engineer, not throttle pulling, um, he was very shortly made president. So technically, Broadhead was named for a man who was the president of the railroad, but not quite at the time the town was named for him. Well, he didn't originate that bell for a name idea. Edgerton did it first. Mr. Edgerton was the president of the railroad earlier and got a town named for him by giving a bell to a church there. Okay, now we are going to talk about um, how the railroad operated, some of its schedules, what it meant to the people here. Uh, but first we're going to uh, do just a little bit of video, uh, break this up. And uh, so we're not just talk and not just video, we'll have some of each. Uh, this first video I will narrate as we go. And we could use uh, light dousing, please. My mother was Joyce Condon, her sister was Rosamond Blackburn originally, married John Plicta. John Plicta was a rail fan from Milwaukee. He shot this film of the Hiawatha coming out of the tunnel at Tunnel City. I share it with you just to show you what the mainline trains were like in the heyday of railroading. And then we'll take a look at the Broadhead line. I will use Broadhead line, Mineral Point line interchangeably. Look at the smoke come out of that tunnel, isn't that cool? Uncle John was born in 1900, came out to Broadhead frequently. Here we are, going around the curve off up the New Glarus branch. Ten-wheeler steam locomotive, the year is 1950, I'm three years old, standing next to him. I can remember when the crossing sign there said, look out for the cars. Here we're going up West Third Avenue, that's Bob Doerr at age nine. <laughs> for real, for real, I'm not making that up. And I, he, Bob was six years older than I. And yeah, it's shady, and uh, Uncle John should have opened up the aperture a bit, but hey, uh, here it is. That may be a wooden caboose, I'm not sure, I can't tell. There's Bob and his dog, they're gonna head west, go up 9th Street toward where he lived. We're in front of Truman Olin's house on the left. Here's the bell, the brass bell are ringing, and we're coming into the uh, water tank right behind this building where we sit at the moment. Steve Saunders' father-in-law, Mr. Albert, tore down that water tower. I have one of the two counterweights you see going up. They weigh about 50 pounds each on that water spout. Railroading was so cool because railroad men looked like railroad men. They wore the Cromer caps and the bib overalls. They had bandanas around their <laughs> necks as a guard against cinders on the collar chafing their neck. Uh, it was just wonderful. And I was a three-year-old watching this, and I remember the movies, and I remember being there. Notice the striped crossing post, black and white stripes. And just to the left of the engine is where uh, Glen Condon's stockyard was. And to the right of the engine was where the coaling shed was, which my scratch-built model of is on a table over here. In just a moment, Uncle John shot a shot of me as a three-year-old here on this platform. There I am, becoming a rail fan. Guess I already was one. That platform ran from the depot all the way to East, East 2nd Avenue. I'm sharing this next sequence with you because it's the best that Uncle John did. This is the Dodgeville line. This shot is in Dodgeville. There's the engineer talking with a bobbing cigar in his mouth. And uh, I'm sharing it because this is a kindred spirit to the Broadhead line. Uh, what the Illinois Central did coming up from Freeport to Dodgeville uh, over west of Browntown is exactly what our railroad branches were doing to New Glarus, to Platteville, to Shulzburg, to Warren, Illinois. Uh, and this picture is taken in 1940. And 
this is the way branch line railroading in southern Wisconsin was. The coaling shed to the left of the depot of the engine is exactly like the broadhead one. Well, very close. <laughs> Kindred spirit. This crew in 1940 could not believe, oh, notice the dirt street in Dodgeville. The crew in 1940 could not believe that a rail fan would take movies for his own use. They conferred and concluded he was from movie tone newsreels and that Lowell Thomas would be narrating this in the theaters. And they all got in. The fireman has crossed over to the right side of the cab. And they all got in the act and they are all striking classic railroad poses. Wooden refrigerator cars cooled with ice. And notice the automobile. Wasn't it a different world? Oh my gosh. Today, OSHA wouldn't let train men on the top of cars. The ladders don't go all the way to the top. What is being shipped on the flat car? Looks like silage with a couple pitchforks in it. I don't know. The train made three round trips a week, up one day and back the next. I think the bunk cars on the right are probably where the, the train crew stayed overnight. The depot in the background, I'll show you a picture of soon. Here they're heading out of Dodgeville for Freeport. The engine would have been built around 1900, sometime between 1900 and 1910, maybe 1899. I don't know. It's what you call a mixed train. That's what Broadhead had it eventually. You see the car, coach windows, and then a baggage door. That's a combination car. There's a partition. It's half baggage and half coach. Railroaders, rail fans call them a combine, just like the farm machine term. And that's what was used on our line up to uh, New Glarus and on our branch, all the branch lines. The branch line to Platteville, the branch line to Schultzburg. And after our Railroad lost its mail contract, which we'll talk about in a minute. A combine was used at the end of passenger service through Broadhead. Notice the cow path crossing the creek to speak Wisconsin. Now ain't that the way the world's supposed to be? Three boxcars and they're all wood. Windows open, no, nothing was air conditioned back then. I remember to cool off on a summer night. Grandpa Loudon would take our 37 Chevy and we'd, we'd go for a 30 mile an hour ride with the windows open. That was the closest thing to air conditioning you'd get. New Orleans, a thousand miles. That was the other end of the Illinois Central. Dodgeville was as far north as the Illinois Central went. Here's Uncle John at age 40. If you were alive, he would be 112 today. He was like a dad to me, closer to me than my dad, actually. I dare say that now that they're all past. He had his camera on automatic pilot, taking a picture of himself eating an apple sitting on the track. <laughs> now here comes the train northbound again. This is the next day. Later I'll show you a still picture of this very scene, the way it looks today. This train was torn up in 1942. And so weedy track with the engine waddling and all the traffic that railroads don't have anymore. There's four cars of livestock. The last livestock was shipped on the Rio Grande in Colorado in the 70s. A car of farm machinery. And three or four cars of goodness knows what. Could be barn lime, it could be lumber, you don't know. And the combine again. Here's coming into Dodgeville. That house beyond the smoke is still there. The right-of-way can be driven. Look at the milk cans on the platform. And notice the hurried pace of the men here. <laughs> Ain't that great? Oh, would you like to buy a ticket in the time machine and go back for a week? One stall roundhouse, so they called them an engine house. The cinder pit and the turntable it was called an armstrong turntable because the big lever on each end took strong arms look at the guys to push there's three on each end and it doesn't just take off spontaneously <laughs> labor intensive industry you've got four or five cars up one day back the next and there are at least eight men in this picture 
Some of them are probably the section men who worked on the track helping to turn the engine. Because the engine crew wasn't that big. The model railroader put the decal crooked on the front number plate. <laughs> Uncle John always said the guy on the near end could have pushed it himself. <laughs> you got it going, it's hard to stop. <laughs> that thing called inertia. Aren't the laws of physics a bummer? Teeter totter turntable, look at that thing bounce. <laughs> Cleaning the ash pit. Or the, the ash pan into the pit, I'm sorry. And here's the last scene of the Dodgeville footage. This is Blotz's Mill Trestle, just south of Dodgeville. Looks like something out of the Wild West, but uh, our railroad had timber trestles out farther west. The Schulzberg branch had a nice timber trestle. Schulzberg branch was torn up in 52. <coughs> Glad I was born as long ago as I was. I caught the tail end of this era able to see a lot of these things. Now next we're going to go to movies I took. This is brought in 1963. And here they're coming around, same place we saw Uncle John's shot of the steam engine. This is 1963 going to New Glarus. The snow doesn't look that bad, but it was a snow day. That's why I was home. I shuffled four sidewalks and grabbed the camera when I heard the train. Heading to New Glarus. Right up West 3rd Avenue. My grandmother, Blackburn, watched them build it in 1880 when she was five. I stood in the same spot to watch them tear it up. She had this keen sense of history, <laughs> keen sense of belonging to a place. I rode trains a lot. This is the train coming into Janesville from Madison, going to Chicago. And we did that a lot. Um, here's 508, used on the Broadhead line many times. 508 often used, right behind the building where we are now, right behind the bank, because the feed mill was still there. The hand car house on the left, and right next to the hand car house had been the coal shed for the steam engines. Memorial Day, 1965. I'm riding as a passenger in Bob Doerr's car, shooting this engine, going from Broadhead toward uh, beyond Judah. Now here it's stalling on the hill, trying to get up to Monroe. It's a small SW9, I believe, but maybe an SW7. Look at the smoke come up from the wheels. They're spinning their wheels here. I was in exactly the right place to catch this train stalling on the hill. <laughs> you were on that train? Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Tell them, no, they stall right here, right where I am. Oh. Were you a brakeman? Yes. So may, I think there's a picture of you. Tell, tell us if you are one of the guys in the hopper car on the back end of the train. This was the last holiday that I, right there. Two guys. Yeah, I believe that's me right there. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Tell everybody your name, sir. Jack Fleming. Yeah, from Janesville. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is coming down from the Glarus. That's amazing, Beck. Honored to have you in the audience. This is the bike trail from the Glarus. This is the summer of 1968 when I worked in the Bank of Broadhead. I was 21 years old. Here I'm shooting through the windshield of my 65 Mustang. Talk about talking on the cell phone. I'm driving and shooting movie. <laughs> Here's the Fairbanks Morris engine, just like the one that's behind the depot now. And the caboose, just like the one that's behind the depot now. And that is that for a moment. Let's get the lights again, and we'll go back to a little more talk about history. I never gave a speech before, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jack, uh, fa fascinating to have you in the audience. You were on that train, and I think all the holiday trains were annulled. After, uh, after Memorial Day 1965. Now, you can tell me, Jack, that was a, a small switch engine, like a, uh, an SW9 or 7, and usually we had like 508, you can look at these up here later, an SD7 or 9. 
By 65, were they still having an engine in Mineral Point and one in Janesville and they met in the middle? And the light engine was going back because it had been to Janesville for servicing? Do you think that might have been the case? No, in 63, in 62, there was a job here. Yes. Yeah. We went out. And they, in 63, they took the job out. So we went out to uh, Mondays, we'd go to Mineral Point. And Tuesdays, we'd make the Platteville branch and back. Wednesday, we'd go to New Glarus, come back. Thursdays, we'd go out to Mineral Point. Come back Friday and then Saturday we go up. That's that 508 and those you couldn't run you couldn't run those little engines up the branch line. You had to have a six wheeler up the branch. Okay, to distribute the weight more evenly over the track. Yes. That is fascinating. Thank you, Jack. So what he's describing in the 60s is the kind of the dying days of the railroad, where a train is going every other day someplace or other. Let's take a look at the heyday. Um, when the railroad was new, we had uh, two mainline passenger trains each way between Janesville and, and Mineral Point. Uh, there were three a day between Broadhead and New Glarus. The trains on the main line were dedicated passengers uh, with other freight trains. Freight trains that went through to Mineral, freight trains that just were peddlers that stopped in the small towns. The branch line trains were all mixed with one of those combination cars and three a day between Broadhead and New Glarus. The pickle factory was the engine house here. There was a train table in front of it originally where the pickle vats were later. The Platteville branch had four trains a day. Each time one of those mainline trains went back, out back, out back, that's four. The Platteville branch made four round trips to meet them all. And so Calamine out there, Calamine had 12 passenger trains a day. So did so did Gratiot with the branches to Warren, Illinois, and Schulzburg. So amazing, just amazing. Uh, so Broadhead had 10 passenger trains a day in 1880, 1910, plus the freight trains. I calculated that in about 1910, there would have been 30 different trains running a day on our railroad. Not all through Broadhead, but on different parts of it in total. Frank Smith, whose store was right over there, had uh, in his possessions a railroad gazetteer. This is the Milwaukee Road Gazetteer from 1875. And it lists every town on the railroad and every business in every town. The railroad only went from Chicago to Minneapolis at that point. And <laughs> this is the story of it. Um, I transcribed it because I didn't want to open up the pages on a copy machine and break the spine of that book. So I, I typed it off uh, in eight typed pages. Uh, Pat, I'll leave this with, the, it's a gift to the museum. Um, the, uh, the description of Broadhead in 1875 on the railroad. Broadhead, Wisconsin incorporated a village in 1870. Did you know that? We were founded in 56, but didn't become a village till 70. It's situated on the southern Wisconsin division of the railroad, 90 miles from Milwaukee and 16 miles from Monroe, the county seat. It lies in the eastern part of Greene County, township of Decatur, and has a population of about 1,500. Sugar River, you'll love this. Sugar River runs by the village, affording a magnificent water power adapted to the heaviest kind of manufacturing. <laughs> the surrounding country is slightly royal, rolling, the soil sandy for one and one quarter miles west of the river and beyond a black loamy prairie stock. That's what uh, Nate Condon lost when the Sugar River Valley didn't make it. The productions are all kinds of grain, wool, tobacco, and cereals. The people are enterprising and thrifty and liberally encourage the location of manufacturers. There is every facility in the way of education and society is good. <laughs> the Norwegian Plow Company uh, was situated in Broadhead. And on the flyleaf of this book, there are two ads. Two plows are pictured. The top one is for the John Deere Plow Company of Moline, Illinois. And the bottom one is for the Norwegian Plow Company, Broadhead, Wisconsin. Which one made it? <laughs> Seriously, what was the difference in the managerial philosophy between those two companies? Why did one uh, become a, a world-known name and the other unknown? 
when I summarized the, uh, the businesses here, uh, and the historical society will have this, but in 1875, Broadhead had, according to this gazetteer, nine grocery stores, seven factories, six physicians, five general merchandise, four milliners, four shoe stores, four tailors, three saloons, one owned by a Frederick Gomber. Would that be a, re a relative spelled different in those days, Frank? Uh huh. G O M B E R at that point. Great, great grandfather. Yeah, amazing. And one of the uh, one of the physicians was Erastus Miller, uh, great great grandfather of a couple of us here. Um, Bartlett and Son Carriage and Wagon Factory, four four carriage and wagon factories in Broadhead. The railroad. Um, well, the railroad had the mail on it. And they used to have railway post office employees. The U.S. Postal Service had employees on the trains. And they had cars that uh, had a, a little door at one end and some little windows, and that's where the postal employees worked. And then there was a big baggage door at the other end. There was a partition in there, and that's where the uh, baggage and express traveled. And uh, the railroads carried five kinds of things when they were new. People, passengers. But they carried the U.S. mail in a railway post office car, call it an RPO. They carried Express, which is what UPS has today. And the Express Company in Broadhead was Wells Fargo. There were 20 Express Companies. Uh, American Express was one, carrying packages before they pervade credit cards. Uh, and the, the 20 Express Companies merged to form Railway Express Agency, REA. There was LCL, which stood for less than carload freight, and that would be such things as uh, the feed mill getting 20 bales of barbed wire or, or six cattle watering troughs, uh, or in my lifetime, four new tires for the 37 Chevy, and I ran from home on foot to roll the tires from the depot back home one at a time, and that was LCL, less than carload freight. And then, of course, there was carload freight, which is, you know, the... the Refrigerator cars full of cheese, and the box car full of lumber, and the copper car full of coal, and on and on with all the obvious stuff we know. <laughs> the last car to anything was barn line. Barn line. Barn line, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. probably yeah. barn into line. The, the, into the, and then into sure, I, I bet you're right that barn line was among the ends of it. And, um, our grandfather Condon would ship uh, livestock from Broadhead. And my dad, who was born in 1909, was 10 years old the first time he went to Chicago, which would make it 1919. And they rode a train of livestock from Broadhead to Chicago Union Stockyards. Talk about service. They assembled a train, a train of livestock here, run it to Janesville, down the main line to Chicago. And it was at night at that. And Dad said the, the uh, train men in the caboose uh, cooked popcorn for him on the caboose stove. Of course, the caboose was lighted with kerosene lamps. And the conductor, uh, freight trains had conductors too, you know, the, the boss of the train. The uh, conductor took him out on the back platform and explained how to calculate mileage and showed him mileposts and timed it with a watch. And it was a minute. And so they were doing 60 miles an hour with a carload of livestock from Broadhead to Chicago Union Stockyards. Yeah, you'd think I was making it up, but Dad lived it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the railroad was very important. You, you heard the, uh, the songs in the movie, um, The uh, Music Man, and, uh, you know, oh, oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming. Mary, you could sing it for us, probably. But <laughs> she could play it on the piano for us. <laughs> but you know what? What could it be? A double boiler, a crosscut saw, or something special just for me? Uh, Broadhead's uh, our, um, Wells Fargo was delivered by wagon. Broadhead had the Wells Fargo wagon coming down the street from the depot. Dad said that in his father's meat market, which was up where the coffee shop used to be, that narrow store with the deep entrance. Uh, if they had something to ship, he would hang a Wells Fargo sign in the window and the wagon driver would see it and they'd stop and, and uh, take it down to the depot to ship. Uh, later it was REA. Rail towns that were bigger had freight houses. Broad had just used the freight room of the depot. Monroe had a freight house next to the depot. Janesville had a huge one. 
Uh, Monroe was big enough to have an REA truck delivering packages in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, Bob Dorr was the last one delivering it in Broadhead. He'd get 25 cents a package to deliver REA with his car. On college vacations, I'd do it and get 25 cents. So I worked for the railroad almost, in a sense, sort of. Um, in 1968 or 69, uh, with the passenger industry dying as it had been known, uh, REA morphed itself into UPS, quit having depots as their distribution centers. It's the same company, though. When you see a UPS truck, be aware it's the same company that used to be REA, same company that used to be Wells Fargo. Been around a long time, long, long time. Um, well, what did the railroad mean to people? Let's talk about that for just a moment. And then we'll take a break and come back for some more video. In fact, you've only seen one third of the video. We've got two more bunches of it yet. Yeah, that's what you came to see. Uh, but the railroad meant everything uh, to society. Uh, right over here on that depot platform, think about it. Uh, the boys in blue went away. Uh, Nathaniel Condon um, had three sons. And the youngest stayed home to work the farm, and, and uh, Ransom went away, and Clinton went away. And Clinton came back with a, a medal and the deed to 80 acres in uh, Nebraska, and Ransom came back in a coffin with a flag on it. And then in two world wars, the, the guys went away from that depot right over there. In the 30s, mom and dad had teaching jobs in separate places, and when they were home for a vacation on Saturday night, they'd take the train from right over there to Milwaukee, and they'd dance to a live dance band, and then dad would take a train to Chicago, and mom would take a train to the Northwoods. At least that's the way they always told it. And I'm sure it was true. I'm sure it was true. And, uh, oh my gosh, life went on there. It was common to hear people say, down by the depot when the cars come in. That was the phrase before cars were automobiles, they were train cars. Over by Helen Beckwith's house, the Reed House, there was a sign I remember when I was a kid, look out for the cars, it didn't say railway crossing. Old, old sign. And uh, Grandma Condon talked about uh, when the four o'clock train would come, going down by the depot when the cars came in to see who was a coming and who was a going, and just to see your neighbors. And maybe you'd get your name in the paper because Mr. Shemp, the owner of the paper, would be there and with a notepad looking for stories. And it would be a place where ah, lovers would part with one last poignant hug, not knowing when they'd see each other, or a place where lovers would reunite with one magnificent hug that was the first step of splendiferous events to come. And, Kids would go off to college, and salesmen would come and go, and a favorite aunt would come to stay for a week, and everything, everything revolved around that depot. It was the center of the community. I suppose on Sundays, church was the other five days of the week. It was down by the depot when the cars came. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic place. As the automobile came on, the two trains a day withered down to one, and the one train became a mixed train with uh, freight cars in it. And so by the 40s uh, and early 50s, as long as we had steam, which was until 1954, September of 54, the diesels came. And uh, the train would come out in the morning, and it would run to Mineral Point from Janesville, and another one would start in Mineral Point and run to Janesville. And early on, they, they met in Gratiot almost at the other end of the line. Uh, no passenger trains on the branches then after the late 30s and in the 40s. Uh, the last day of passenger service in Broadhead was in June of 1958. And I'll tell you how they were running the railroad then. They had one of these bigger engines, the SD9, based in Janesville, and the mixed train would head out of Janesville and run to Monroe, but first from Broadhead it'd go up to New Glarus and back. And another train, Van Marsh, with a SD9, would start out of Mineral Point with a mixed train and run to Monroe. And they would meet there, and the engine and crew would go back home where they came from. They'd swap trains to make a through run. Those two trains in a day were a far cry from the 30 that had run out here 40 years before 
but it was still trains and it was still great fun. I figured out as a 10 year old that the train going to Monroe was the same engine and crew coming back. So if I bought a ticket to Monroe, I could not get stranded. <laughs> they would bring me back. They couldn't come back before they got there. And so a round trip ticket to Monroe was 42 cents. And usually I didn't get, I didn't get a, an allowance, but if I asked for 50 cents for mowing the lawn, mom knew what I was up to, I'd get a 50 cent piece. I would run down to the depot, right down there, as fast as I could, I'd give her grip the 50 cent piece, he'd give me a round trip ticket to Monroe, and I would have eight cents change. I would then run up to the standard station, which is exactly where we're sitting now, right where I'm standing, was the last nickel pop machine in Broadhead. I'd get a bottle of pop for five cents, I'd still have three cents left over. I'd run back to the depot, sit up on the baggage wagon with my back against the brick wall of the depot. I'd save that bottle of pop for riding on the train, because I wanted all my pleasures at once. <laughs> And on a hot summer day, that brick wall on the north side of the depot was the coolest place in town. I'd never been in an air-conditioned building, and I don't think many people had. And so I'd sit there and wait for the train, and I'd think about all the great days of the past. I would think already about the changes in my lifetime. By 58, hmm, I was, uh, I was 11, but I could remember being four and running down there with Mom when there were still RPO cars and steam engines. Mom would write a letter in a hurry, grab me by the hand and run from our house down to the depot, give the letter to the guy in the RPO car. And as that engine would come by, it was the grandest thing in the world. The earth would shake beneath its wheels, you know. And nothing like the chuffing of a steam locomotive and the clanging of the brass bell and the beautiful chimes of the whistle. It was phenomenal. And the as the engine passed on a cold winter day, the space between the engine and the depot, even if it was 20 below zero out, would suddenly be flooded in warmth. It'd be 80 degrees in there. And then the engine would pass and you're back to 20 below zero. <laughs> I think a steam locomotive was, what, 4% efficient? Something like, yeah, for every 100 scoops of coal you shoveled in the firebox, four ran it and 96 went up the smokestack. But it was beautiful. Grandest machine ever invented. Absolutely wonderful. And as I sat there on the baggage wagon in 1958 waiting for the train to come and take me to Monroe, I would remember 1954 when I was a second grader and the steam engines quit coming and the diesels started coming. And I would check out of my classroom, I'd sign out to the bathroom and I'd run out of the school, the red brick school by the tracks with no protective barrier because even a five-year-old know enough to get out of the way of a train, and they always did. And I'd run over to the tracks and I'd look down the track hoping to see a plume of smoke that a steam engine was coming back, and it never did. <laughs> and sometimes I'd sit down on the rail and cry because I wanted a steam engine to come back. And then I'd go back to the class and I'd trudge in, and, uh, and the teacher would look at me, you know, and I'd say, you okay? Oh yeah, fine. <laughs> What was I going to say? I left school without permission. I went over to the tracks. I was hoping to see a steam engine. I didn't see it, so I sat on and cried. They would have either had me in, in, in a mental asylum, or the principal would have just beat the hell out of me. And I don't know which, but it wasn't going to be good. I didn't dare tell anybody what really was going on. I kept it to myself. And so, uh, the great days of the railroad, being in the depot with the flickering fire on an autumn night in that coal stove in the waiting room, waiting to ride to Milwaukee to see my uncle, who was the rail fan, and Aunt Rosman, uh, fantastic. And there on the, on the walls was a poster of Uncle Sam making a muscle with a boxcar strapped to each foot in this picture. And the caption was, rolling to victory. I mean, the railroad was everything to everybody. It was phenomenal. I can remember riding to Milwaukee and not a seat available in 1951 or two. That late, it still was used a lot. Having to sit on the armrest of mom's chair all the way to Janesville before we got on the connecting train to, to Milwaukee. Phenomenal stuff. And it was changing fast. So by 58, I'd sit there and I'd remember the changes I'd seen already in just four or five years that was the total span of my memory. In 58, I was riding the train frequently 
One time Jeff and I went together. I'd have been, I was 10 and he was eight at the time. Two boys leaving town all alone on the train. <laughs> it was a winter day, bright sunny day, the snow glistening outside, cold. We calculated how warm we wanted to be in that passenger car by how far away from the coal stove we sat. The, uh, the, the cars were built in the Milwaukee shops in the 1930s, but the interior appointments were all scavenged from wooden coaches built in the 1880s. I think even the window sashes were. Had kerosene lamps in them. The, the, the coach seats all had patent dates in the 1880s. The, the coal burning stove did too. The, uh, the best part of all was the toilet. The, the toilet was a straight pipe toilet. And so you go into the bathroom, you look into the toilet, and you see the track going by. <laughs> One day in the spring of 1958, when I was 11, I went to the, on a summer day, I went to the coal bin by the stove, stove wasn't running, grabbed a piece of coal, went to the bathroom, threw it at the toilet. When the, I got off the train back and brought it, I jogged back out along the track and I found that piece of coal. And that piece of coal stayed on my dresser until I sold that house right over there in 1997 because an 11-year-old boy is going to cherish a piece of coal that's been through a toilet. <laughs> that's the way we are. And Jeff and I didn't get in any trouble. We were so good because we didn't want disapproving adults to trifle with our emerging autonomy. Usually I tried to ride alone. I was afraid with a bunch of rowdies, somebody would lay down the law that we couldn't do that anymore. And so uh, then uh, one day, only two brief anecdotes and we'll take our five minute break, but came the dread day. I'm riding the train to Monroe. I stick my head out the window, jauntily pretending I'm the engineer. I'm looking for tadpoles in the ditch. I'm looking at the crops. I'm back in the country where only a hunter or a hiker could go. This is phenomenal, the view from the train and the clickety-clack and the burbling of that diesel engine and the coach rocking and the engine rocking separately in unpredictable pattern. Just beautiful and presently I am hit in the face with a spray. And I said, what is that? I looked around and I'm hitting the face with the spray again. I look up, there's not a cloud in the sky, but I am hit in the face with a spray. So I looked farther out the window and the baggage door on the combine are just like this. The baggage door was open and the REA man was standing there relieving himself to the summer winds. <laughs> And I, I went to the cooler, the little conical Dixie cups, you remember? I poured a hundred of those over my head, as thoroughly grossed out as an 11-year-old boy could be at having had the baggage man pee in his face. Was not good. Not good at all. Not good at all. The last anecdote before we take our break uh, was the only cloudy day I remember. Time after time after time, it was a bright sunny day and the memories are full of bright sunny days riding the train and the get to Monroe and the crew would always give me an, an, a message for the crew of the other engine. So I'd have to climb up in the cab of a railroad engine. There was nothing greater than that in my life until I met Patricia. And, <laughs> and <laughs> but I remember a cloudy day. And this was a rainy, rainy day, and I knew by then that they were going to take the passenger train off. And I thought, you know, this isn't good. Up until age 11, I thought everything goes on forever, maybe even me. You know, I hadn't thought much about it, but now they're going to get rid of the passenger service here. And, and so I nestled down deeply into that leather seat, and the end platform of the coach was wide open, and the rain was hitting the open platform out there. And the diesel engine was burbling it away at about 20, 25 miles an hour. And the cars were rocking and the windows were open. And it was dark, dark, dark. And the thunder rolled over Jordan Prairie. And four old retired railroad men were in a couple rows behind me. And they were talking about their great days of their life on the railroad. And I was thinking, why does the neat stuff have to end? Why can't this go on forever? And uh, it was the first time maybe as a person I grew philosophical 
I was thinking, I get back to Broadhead, I'm going to run through that rainstorm as fast as I can go over to Grandpa Blackburn's store through the rain, and I'll putter around helping him in the store, and when it's closing time, we'll walk up to the house through the rain together, and I'm thinking, that store isn't going to last forever. Grandpas don't last forever either, do they? And then we'll get home and we'll smell, cupper, smell supper on the cook stove, a wood-burning cook stove. And I'm thinking, dang it, that cook stove isn't going to last forever. Mom's talking about getting an electric stove. I wasn't the one who had to use the wood-burning cook stove <laughs> in 1958. In 58, she got an electric stove, but when I was riding the train that day, we still had a wood-burning cook stove, and to me, that was cool. Just as cool as our 37 Chevy. Hunking down gravel roads on a summer night at 30 miles an hour so we could get cool before air conditioning. And so that was, a, that was an interesting trip, an interesting trip, and it has stayed with me forever. Well, the last trip, and then we'll take our break. The last trip was in June of 58, and I rode the train and came back to Broadhead, and I, I politely let Bob Doerr get off the train ahead of me so I could say I was the last passenger on the railroad through town. And until a fan trip came in 1987, I was, I was the last passenger to get off the real railroad, the Milwaukee Road here. I got off the train and I thought, where are the adults? When this railroad was new, the party lasted for two days. It was the biggest thing to ever hit town. Hit town, town wouldn't have existed without it. It created the town. And here, Bob Doerr and I are the only people watching. You'd think Miss Broadhead would be there with a dozen roses for the conductor, and that the tracks would be lined with people dressed in black for mourning all the way to the county line. Where are they? Yeah, well, I guess that was my first lesson. At age 11, uh, I have a keen sense of history. I guess everybody doesn't, but, <laughs> but I do. And you do, and that's why we're here tonight together. So on that note, let's take a break. And Pat, how long do you want the break to be? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, at 10 to 9, we'll come back and uh, get on with the show. Uh, this is 1987, the fan trip coming to Broadhead, and Pat Whedon said he was working on that with the, the North Freedom Museum crew. Um, and that's the first time a steam engine had come to Broadhead since 1954 in September, when we ran these fan trips. It, as my grandpa would have said, it did my heart good to hear a steam whistle in Broadhead again. Classmate Rexanne Ronneberg, who used to work in this bank, uh, Rexanne Olin, said it brought tears to her eyes just to hear that steam engine in town one more time. 1987. Um, I went around town taking pictures. This is 1970. Uh, in the lower right is my 65 Mustang convertible. Uh, Patricia said to me, um, did you like having a Mustang? And I said, I loved it. And she says, I think you should get one every 45 years. So we have a 2010 out front. And, uh, you know, it, 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 45 years from now, I'll be 108 and we'll get another one. But that's uh, where the railroad ended. Uh, there's a track in the street coming past the cold storage. And of course, we, even those of us who love history, don't do what we know we should do. One day in about 1963, I saw a wooden refrigerator car parked at that cheese warehouse. A iced refrigerator, old, old car, and I said, you know, next time I see one of those in town, I'll take a picture of it. <laughs> right. There's the Goldenrod Creamery. The track never went quite that far, but it ended about beside where I am. And uh, what a memory, going hunting out in Decatur, walking all the way from Broadhead out to Decatur on a cold winter day. You could hear the milk cans from that clanging around five miles out of town. I would go out there. Uh, repeat. Here's another shot of the steam train coming into town for the fan trips. I wrote some. I, um, uh, Cousin Glenn riding the train. And the observation car from North Freedom that Pat Wheaton was riding in at the moment I took this picture. You're in there, Pat. Look closely, folks, see if you can find him. Uh, the train down there by the depot, down by the depot when the cars come in. Uh, the coal shed on the right uh, was right where our grandfather's uh, loading pens for the stockyard had been. Uh, 
right there. And uh, of course the bank is back here and these buildings are gone and the bank is bigger. Uh, just a grab shot, kind of blurry, but it's heading to Monroe. But that Northwestern engine, virtually identical for all practical purposes to the engines that the Milwaukee Road ran out here until the 50s. Those engines were 40, 50 years old by the time they were done out here. Uh, coming up the hill, the same place I had the movie of the diesel stalling. Only this is about 15 years later. The most entertaining part of the show is going to be me trying to advance the slides. Here's coming into uh, Monroe. The overpass is gone. The cheese buildings are gone. There had been a railroad track next to the sidewalk. When I went in there, uh, there was a lot going on railroad-wise riding the train in 54. Uh, this is the depot in Monroe. Now the cheese center moved several blocks away. The feed mill behind it is gone. During the heyday of passenger service, this guardrail and these roads weren't there. It was all tracks through there. Another shot in Monroe of the fan trip. I called the buildings on the left Cheese Row in my own mind as a kid. There used to be a siding in front of that with refrigerator cars parked at it. Marty had its own cheese uh, refrigerator cars that said Marty Monroe on them. This is the first photograph I ever took. I was 11. This is the last day that passenger service ran to Broadhead. There's the train behind Bjork's, behind the doghouse, uh, switching uh, in town. Here's another picture of that combine, combination car, and Mr. Barry, the conductor. Uh, did, you know, did you know Barry, Jack? Uh, his boy hired me. Oh, yeah, I, I know the old man, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Barry was always very kind to me when I would ride the train, and here's down by the depot, the last time the cars came in, June of 58. Uh, here's one of the cars from the Broadhead Line. I found it in the Toma shops 20 years later. Broadhead in, uh, I'm sorry, Monroe in the, about 1975. The freight house on the left has been repainted white for use by a feed mill. Look at all the trucks now hauling cheese. Uh, didn't do my heart good in the wheat grown track. Uh, here's Broadhead in uh, the summer of 68. And uh, the next shot is uh, uh, behind the depot, autumn of 68. I grabbed that picture because I thought this could be the last time there's ever this much activity at the Broadhead depot. There's a Pierce furniture truck loading furniture out of the baggage room. Looks good for the railroad. Actually, Pierce was renting that as warehouse space. Uh, behind the Pierce music, Truck, or Pierce furniture truck is a boxcar of lumber being unloaded one stick at a time, probably by Jake Jones, onto a uh, flatbed truck to be taken across the street to the green buildings to Roderick Lumber, where it'll be unloaded one stick at a time into the lumber yard buildings. Today, lumber comes shrink wrapped and is unloaded off a flat car by a forklift. But still in 1968, it was coming in a boxcar, one stick at a time. There's a flatbed and a crane on this side next to the park. That's night manufacturing, loading farm machineries to be shipped out by rail. 1968, it's easy to forget how fast things change, isn't it? The oldest rail in, the, in town, by the way, I checked the dates on all the rails, was right next to the park. 1880 was the oldest I found in the 50s. Hello, guys. Um, wooden bunk cars behind the track. This is 1968. Look at the deplorable condition of the track. A succession of short line operators went broke out here, but Wisconsin Southern is making it. They run all over southern Wisconsin, uh, almost as far up as Appleton and to Chicago. The track today is, in my opinion, Jack, correct me if you think I'm wrong, the track today is the best condition it's ever been in. Uh, the end of the, uh, I love cabooses, another thing we've lost. Uh, the hand car house, and behind it a wooden box car. And behind that along the cheese factory are conveyors from, that used to take milk cans out of the cheese factory. The world was changing fast in 1968. The Reed house, Helen Beckwith's house. Um, Al Ringling roomed there when he worked in Broadhead and started doing trapeze acts in the attic. Helen Beckwith told me his trapeze was up there. I went up there, I saw it. 
I thought, but I won't speak for it because certainly somebody from the Circus World Museum in Baraboo is going to come get that. <laughs> Duh. I was the only one person alive at the time who knew it was there, probably, after she died. Um, well, I guess we've seen that before, and we've seen that before, and here's uh, Race Street, Truman Nolan's house, um, that, or West Third Avenue. I always called it Race Street. My, my family always used the old names. West Second Avenue was Clinton Avenue, you know. Um, that's the, uh, yeah, that's the line to New Glarus. Uh, the power plant, uh, neat place as a small boy, go watch the water come out of the power plant on a cold winter day. A big excitement in Broadhead. The pickle factory, the track ran up between the vats. The vats were open. Nasty little boys used to defile those vats. <laughs> but I've read that they had to be open because that's what made the pickles green. If they had not cured in sunlight, the pickles would have been white. I've, I've read that. Technically, this wasn't a factory. It was a, in the parlance of the industry. It was a salting station. There had been a turntable instead of the vats and platforms and a door in the end of that building, and that's where the New Glarus line train spent the night. Another view of the pickle factory, as everybody called it. The train heading toward Monroe, 1973. The depot is starting to look dowdy. The track isn't any too great. Just pictures around town. That looks better today without the windows boarded up. The paint redone for the bicentennial in 76. Um, Okay, that's uh, Dodgeville, the Illinois Central train we saw in the movie, so a couple pictures of that. Typical of what would have come to Broadhead. Here's the train coming down Race Street from New Glarus. Um, yeah, it's by your house. Yeah, you're, yeah, this was Ingebrigtsen's, that was Regal's, across the street is Wishes. In the park. The park is to the left. My great-grandma Hannah Smith, the, the same one with the Edison light bulb, uh, she said that when she was a new mom in the mid-1870s. Her best friend lived in the house that became Wishes, and she would push the buggy, no sidewalks and no paving, so the sand was so deep in Race Street it was hard to push a buggy, and by the time she got up there, the hem of her dress would be full of kinny burrs as the world changed. Uh, Russ Porter was the art director of Model Railroader magazine in 1951 when he took these pictures. Never, never published by a guy who published a lot. This is the Broadhead train at Gresham at the Coal Tower. And looking back from the engine past the combine to the Coal Tower. Elmer Duxted, Maggie was his nickname, at about age 72, engineer on the train through Broadhead, at the controls of the steam engine, of course. Looking toward Broadhead from the left side of the cab of the steam engine, that's Highway 11 right in front of the engine, going up the hill over the track. Uh, Grashit, 1942, still an RPO, railway post office car behind the engine and a coach behind that. And uh, it's waiting for a meet with the train from Min Mineral Point. On Sundays, they ran clear through from Milwaukee to Mineral Point without freight cars. The rest of the week, they originated in Janesville. This is uh, 1965, I think. The engine 508 crossing the street in, in um, not Darlington. No, uh, oh, is it Darlington? Yeah, it's Darlington. I'm sorry, I had a brain fade. This is the year I was in kindergarten, 1952, Janesville. This train has come all the way from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, running across Iowa all night, and uh, in the wee hours of the morning, it crossed the Mississippi at Prairie du Chien, has come along the Wisconsin to Madison, now headed for Chicago, and the train you see best is the Broadhead train being made up, and it will head to West Yard, grab its freight cars, and head for Mineral Point and Broadhead. And this is 1954, the last month the steam ran. That car is the same as I have a model of on the table. September 1954. Running from the depot in Janesville to pick up its freight cars at the yard behind the photographer and head to Broadhead. 
The roundhouse is now run by Wisconsin Southern. It is beautiful. Next time you take Highway 11 to Janesville, take a look at the railroad yard there. That roundhouse looks the best it ever has. A succession of um, short line operators failed out here. The first was Chicago, Madison, and Northern. They had a cute color scheme, cute caboose, cute business car. That's probably one reason they didn't make it. Everything was too cute and but not enough business. The uh, Central Wisconsin Railroad didn't make it either. That was the Blue Ox. If Cousin Glenn was here, here's the, they're switching the Woodbridge plant. Uh, 1965, back to my 65 Mustang, and uh, I guess it's 68, but it's a 65 Mustang, Mineral Point, uh, in its dying days, very decrepit at that point. Um, you know, this is later when it's boarded up, this is about 1984, just before the tracks were pulled, whatever year that was, I think it's about 84, the Walker House in the mid-70s, looking terrible. Nobody makes it there either. People keep taking it over. Here's a, it's got a different owner, a different sign, and nobody makes it there. This is literally Mineral Point. That's where lead was discovered with the depot behind it. Here's a buddy of mine on the track at Mineral Point, uh, early 80s. The red tailings pile from the zinc mill, long gone, improved with grass. I like the history myself. The railroad from Mineral Point, by the way, was a separate company. It was built from Mineral Point down to Warren, Illinois, to connect with the Galena line from Chicago. The same year the train came through Broadhead, we didn't connect with them until 1882, uh, built from Monroe over to Gratiot to connect with them. And I mentioned the Sugar River Valley building its roadbed to, to Albany. In 1880, the Milwaukee Road acquired that and built its new Glarus branch on it. So part of the Mineral Point Railroad got used from Broadhead to Albany. The part from Broadhead to Avon is still sitting there. Uh, Mineral Point, the roundhouse used to be in the weeds on the left. Uh, that cement wall is the foundation of what was the world's largest zinc mill. Mineral Point had a tremendous amount of business going on. This is about 1975. If you've now been to the Mineral Point Museum, for heaven's sakes go, there I am at age 37. Um, it is a gorgeous restoration. I have four dioramas on display upstairs that I built for them, three depots and one mining scene. Um, it is as fine a museum as you'll find anywhere. The depot at Dunbarton on the Schulzburg branch. Downtown Schulzburg. Uh, Water Street Pub and Eatery on the left. Um, and ore bin in the yards. History, history, history. Shellsburg was a mining town. Here's where the lead and zinc ore got dumped into the train. All long gone. Here's Darlington. I've always loved convertibles. There's my 1982 Datsun. And the depot at Livingston on the Chicago and Northwestern over by Platteville. Everything dying in the 60s. Remember the movies, Uncle John's movies at uh, Dodgeville with the depot? There it is in 1984. The Coaling Tower at Montfort Junction, concrete, so it still stands, surrounded by windmills today. Uncle John on the platform at Gresham. He's 74 years old there. You don't find any mines out by Schulzburg anymore, but in 67, there was still this one standing our heritage. The turntable at Benton on the end of the line from Madison. Remember the scene of the train coming th through the cut under the bridge? Uh, that's the way it looks today. Linden, northwest of Mineral Point. There was a Mineral Point and Northern Railroad. The uh, depot platform shows on the left. <laughs> Here's the right-of-way headed for Highland, 30-mile railroad. Here's the feed mill at Highland. That railroad lasted, there's the depot at Highland to build onto. That railroad was built in 1905, died in 1930. Lasted only 25 years, but it hauled a ton of mining goods. Refrigerator car at Herbert Brewery. The track long gone, but in uh, the early 80s, they were still shipping beer by rail. And the last slide, uh, it's the yard office at West Yard in Janesville, made out of an 1880s coach. And uh, that's where the trains come into Broadhead when they got their paperwork for the freight cars. 
And that's the kind of car whose interior appointments were outfitted into the cars used uh, out here at the end in the 50s. And Pat, um, let's get um, the lights for just a minute. And we'll, uh, we'll conclude with just a, uh, I guess just a, a brief statement of what the railroad meant to me and then end with one last video. To me, the railroad was a focal point. It was emblematic of society. It was an icon of everything else in my world. But it was the most interesting part of it. I was born into a world with no television, no air conditioning, and a 37 Chevy that never came out of the barn in the winter. If you wanted to go someplace, you rode the train or, or walked. And I am fortunate to have had the railroad as a focal point, the most interesting, fascinating, beautiful, central feature of society for me. Well, focal points have peripheries, and the periphery is defined by the focal point. And, and so, to me, the railroad was, yeah, it was trains, and it was steam and smoke, and I tell Pat, maybe we should get a potpourri dish, put some valve oil in it and coal dust, and light a candle underneath, and uh, maybe we can make our house smell like a steam engine. <laughs> she hasn't tried it yet. And, and, and so the trains, and especially the steam engines, were the focal point. But uh, in the nearby periphery was a, a red brick school right along the tracks where we could play by the trains. One day I was bouncing a volleyball off the side of the train, didn't notice that a door was open, the volleyball went into a boxcar. I chased, I chased it out to by Chub Creek past the cemetery. They stopped, they gave me the volleyball. I was a half hour late coming back to, from recess. Mrs. Collins asked, what were you doing? Well, the volleyball went on the train, I chased the train, stopped the train, got the volleyball, and had to walk back to town. And she's gone. Right. <laughs> anyway, um, the trains were the focal point. The railroad was the focal point for me. But in close periphery was crowds of people on Saturday night right over here. So numerous that you had to walk a zigzag path just to get down the street. You remember that? Friday nights. Well, Friday nights, you're young. <laughs> That's right. What, eight, eight? Yeah, Friday nights the businesses were open. When I was young, it was Saturday night. Saturday night downtown. And the trains were the focal point, but the crowds on Saturday night. And, and the aroma of Just Chef's popcorn wafting from the popcorn yeah. wagon on the corner with the little twinkling yellow lights. And the chimes from the Lutheran church mixing with that, playing hymns back before anybody thought that violated their civil rights. And the, the trains were the focal point for me, but I also remember down in Champaign when I'd visit Dad, the horse-drawn milk wagon coming and delivering a bottle of chocolate milk, glass bottle of that, just for me. The trains were my focal point, but it was also a world of friendly country crossroads stores with glass pop gas, glass top gas pumps out front. And, and, uh, Somebody, once in a while, still cranking a Model T Ford, right over there. Saw it any number of times. It was a world of um, country churches with hymns wafting from the open windows out over green pastures in the stillness of a Sabbath morn. It was a world of little boys who shot cap guns at imaginary bad men, and little girls who served imaginary tea to little friends who wanted to grow up to be ladies. And when the steam engines went away, and the orange and maroon passenger cars went away, and at last the branch line trains themselves went away and came no more again through the grassy meadow down by the creek, some sensitive hearts mourned their loss. For it was the most vibrant, colorful thread of civilization pulled out of the tapestry and, and cast away. One more definition of home, no longer quite what it had been before. And so people ask me, Greg, why do you love trains? And my response is, well, if you have an hour and a box of Kleenex, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Pat, let's do that last video. This video was made in 1978, 
and it shows the uh, the final days of the Milwaukee Road through here before the short line operators began their work out here. But the line to Mineral Point went in the mid 80s, never to be restored, and. Um, it's not just that trucks took it on. You realize our world has changed. The industry that used to be in Mineral Point just isn't there anymore. The industry that used to be in Broadhead just isn't here anymore. And so this picture was taken in uh, the pre-dawn light. Uh, it gets better. Uh, one of the SD9s switching in Mineral Point. It's picking up its caboose. Jack, were you on this? No. <laughs> not this one. Uh, there was no business this day in Mineral Point. They are picking up uh, their caboose and heading for Janesville. It's getting a little lighter now. Uh, maintenance had been deferred. And so when you think about 30 trains a day on the Mineral Point line, uh, all the 10 passenger trains a day through Broadhead, if you count the New Glarus branch, which of course you would, uh, then you see the grass-grown track here. You realize that while we weren't really noticing the changes, Huge changes had come. Look at the gravel roads in 1978, how fast we forget. I didn't remember how many gravel roads were still around in 78. Isn't that amazing? And this is September, a beautiful time of year. And here's the train at Calamine, and they've picked up several empty uh, fertilizer cars. Here's a shot from the left side of the engine, the fireman's side of the engine coming down to a switch, rail fans taking pictures up ahead there on the left of the track. You can't see a tie here, and they didn't replace ties by then unless they needed to because of a derailment. Uh, nothing had been maintained very much. Um, a few ties right at the switch, so you can find the switch. Uh, the speed limit from Monroe to Mineral Point at this point is 10 miles an hour. Look at the thing rock. And weedy. No new ties for a long time. And you know that with the little business left out there and 10 mile an hour speed limit on that track and no new ties installed, the company has no intention of any future here. They're going to milk it for a few years and when it just isn't operable anymore, they're going to let it sink. That was some of the lightest rail in the United States. 65 pound rail out there. Here's a deer trail down the middle of the track. Original rails from 1882 for the most part. Ain't that something. A few ties by a bridge because you didn't want to dump it into the, you could kill somebody if you dumped it in the hole there, but other than that, at 10 miles an hour, if you went off the track, you weren't likely to do much damage. You probably wouldn't tip anything over. You'd spend half a day pulling it back on and you'd go on with life. A young engineer in 1978. Here's the steel bridge coming into Gratiot, uh, Darlington, and that's still there, a recreation trail. You can see that bridge from the highway. And here's a boxcar at an industry yet. And uh, the white building on the right used to be half the depot, it was cut off and sold. <laughs> the dairy plant to the left doesn't have a siding anymore. Kind of the story of railroading in the small towns. But they have a few more cars to pick up in uh, Darlington. 1978, a lot of caveman beards and haircuts. <laughs> and that's the 518, which came out here a lot. 508 came out here a lot. At the end of the passenger era in 1958, 512 came out here a lot. You'll see in a minute um, a wigwag signal when this train crosses the main street of Darlington. There's a signal that swings that had a red light in it. Those were called wigwags. They're extinct today, or nearly so. Broadhead had a couple. West 2nd Avenue had a man in a shed, a crossing shanty, that would come out with a stop sign until I was in second grade, folks. It's hard to believe how much has changed. And he would flip his switch in his shanty, and at Main Street here and West 3rd Avenue, over by Ross Olin's, the wigwags would go off, but they were manually controlled. 
And now we're going to play a little music that just captures for you the, um, the mood I had and that I saw in this dying industry, 30 trains a day, passenger trains, and now uh, it was disappearing before our eyes. And that's about the size of it. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. The closing line is, um, as we get the lights here, I'll keep talking so nobody tries to get up and leave in the, in the dark. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. It's uh, been the audience of a lifetime for me. Uh, if there uh, hereafter be, let's all meet again down by the depot when the car is coming. <laughs>